Hey there, and welcome back to this video tutorial related to Dakota and optimization. Uh, we have received uh, now many questions of people asking to, to develop a series of, of training videos related uh, to couple now Dakota with uh, open phone fluent of with any genetic uh, black box solver. So we're working on that. It takes some time, but just to give you a sneak preview in this video, we're going to show you a small sample to how to link Dakota with OpenFun in this case. So we work in our channel a lot with CFD, we use a lot OpenFun, but it's not limited to that, okay? You can couple any black box solver. So in any case, uh, recall that you have the website, it's very good, uh, the website, and you have a lot of information here. The latest version is, is 6.18. Also in the documentation, you have resources, you have many examples also you want to go through. Examples, okay, simple examples, C++, Python integration, and so on. Textbook examples, you have it there. It's very well documented documented and also you have the documentation which it is uh, really good i have to say but maybe you are not familiar with some concepts you, you might get a little bit lost in some theoretical aspects but it's very good for those looking for the gui interface you have here also how to use it with some examples later we're going to do to to do a video using the the graphical user interface but as i say in previous videos no when i was addressing the installation that i don't use the GUI too much i prefer to use the command line interface that since can i can parameterize things much much easier and one of the big uh Improvements in, in version 6.18 is the Python integration, which is fantastic, and I want to stress that that for me that is very important. For instance, I use XGBoost you now, this fantastic model for machine learning, and I manage now to have a, a cleaner interface. And also in theory, I will have a cleaner interface with PyTorch and all those tools used with neural networks. Later also, I will talk about that, but I don't use it for for reconstructing solutions in CFD stuff like that. Honestly, I'm not a big believer of that because it's very expensive. I use it for something else, but yeah, there are many approaches, many things to do. Uh, hopefully now computational power will get, uh, will increase a lot more in the future. And yeah, this might be an option. So let's go to our case. So in the video description, let me go. I would work in Windows Subsystem Linux again, I have everything. Uh, let me check. I will use Dakota version 19 and I will use OpenFun 11. So before going to, into the case in the video description, you have the link to download everything. Just a brief in, in introduction now, where is Dakota? So I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's an optimization, optimization tool. Fantastic. It has a lot of capabilities, parameter studies, design experiments, and com computer experiments, sensitivity analysis, uncertainty quantification, and, and so on, okay? Then the big question is, why do I use the coda? Because there are many tools. So you have Matlab, Scilab, Octave, Java, Python, whatever, even R, that you can do. Uh, uh, you, you can use many optimization libraries that are very good. And the main reason why I like to use Dakota is, the Dakota is these three, three reasons, now three couple of features. Simulation, failure capturing, restart capabilities, and parallel synchronous or concurrent simulations, evaluation. So basically this means that Dakota, it is able that even if you have an error that to keep running, okay, something the user will need to, to define, no, but you can keep running and it will detect any any error. Also, you can restart. So it's not like you have a problem or I don't know whatever happened to your computer then shut down and you lose everything. So you can start and restart from the latest safe state. And then you can run many cases at the same time. So that means that, for instance, you have enough computational resources, you can launch a hundred simulations at the same time, and each of those hundred simulations can be in parallel. So as you see, you can get a lot of data in a short amount of time. And here's where, when I was mentioned that I like to use XUBoost because I can get a lot of data and then to analyze that data, it can be a little bit tricky. So I put all my metrics and then I do my regression and I try to 
to, to, to get a better insight of what is happening. So a little bit some methods that are implemented. I'm not going into details, by the way, the list is not complete by any means. So there is a lot inside the code. And as I've mentioned that now there is an interface to Python. So intuitively, everything, all those drivers that, that, that you have in Python that you have you know, in the open source, the galaxy of applications, every single of those applications can be now interfaced in a very transparent way with Dakota. So basically your options now are, are unlimited. And to give you, you know, a brief uh, general idea, what is an optimization loop, you know, engineering, engineering design, a very uh, general one. So basically what you do is connect many applications and just keep running all the loop to get better, better iteration. So you have a starting point, then you need to have a, a coupling, the code coupling interface that in our case would be Dakota. Then you need to deploy your simulations. And here, you know, you want to have concurrent simulations, many simulations at the same time. So here it's important to have an application that can manage that, but also to have computational resources. Then in the, here, I just mentioned that I can deploy everything in the cloud to do modifications, your black box application can be anything. You need to compute metrics because you are optimizing something. And with from these metrics, then you get sensitivities. Okay. That is how the solution change in your design space. And there are many methods. Okay. So just to mention that you can do design space exploration, survey based optimization, a joint optimization, traditional gradients, whatever you want, you can do. Okay. So the, what is important is that you need to compute those sensitivities. And after you have that, just get better can candidates and keep iterating. So here in this, this look, look at that, I put this machine learning or AI robot that is gathering information also that can help you to assess you know, your solution. And in this big picture, also you have uncertainty quantification and robots design with all this data, you can then I'll take the ne next step and get into robust design. Uh, for instance, this is later I'm going to show you all this short application and look at that. Many applications are here interacting. So I'm using Dakota for all the call coupling optimization and concurrent simulations. Then all the parametrical CAD is done using on shape and using the API. It's a, Python base, then my block, black box solver is open from can be anything. There is a lot of uh, quantitative qualitative post processing, everything based in Python, Parview, Par JavaScript, also real time data monitoring. So I, I rely a lot in R. It's a beautiful tool, if you know, if you know it, but also you can use Python and then, well, you have it there. So now talking about the specific about Dakota, how does it work? So Dakota will, will take an input file where you formulate your problem. Okay. And then with this input file that you have the formulation is going to set up the whole case. So you will need to create a template directory where you have a case that you know it is running. And this is very important. You need to formulate your problem, but also you need to, to have a case that is running because that is the case that is going to be parameterized. Also, you need to, to, to define the parametrical variables and everything is controlled by Dakota. So when you move into this gray box here, you know, that is the simulation script that is orchestrating everything. Dakota is going to take all that information, change variables and create new directories, run simulation and evaluate different functions and variables and get your metrics. In the end, you need to get that metric, that output, and that code that use it here, give it back here, and then it keep looping. Okay, so we're going to see how to set up this, uh, this workflow. It's relatively easy as soon as you get an idea how it works, but it's very easy. And to show this, I'm going to use this very, very simple application. So I guess we're all familiar with the driven cavity. It's a very fast case. So what we want to do here is that in the middle of the cavity, I want to measure the pressure and then I want to find the velocity that is going to give me the lowest, the, the maximum pressure at the center of the gravity. So kind of I want to have, because you know that here you, you have the vortex moving, I want to have the vortex in the center of the gravity, okay? I'm not doing no precisely that, but if you want to give an narrative uh, 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 interpretation will be kind of, that would be the, interpre the, the interpretation. So here we have our loop, our closed loop, everything done, no using the classical open phone 
tools or block mesh, dissolvers, and so on. But you can put anything here. So in the end, we're going to, 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 to run two simple cases, a parametric study. So we start from a velocity value, and then we measure pressure to find the maximum pressure. And look at that already here. We know that it will be something about 0.5 five here. So this is a parametric study. Now, so by no means we're optimizing, but it happens that we find a solution here. And then we have the uh, optimization method, a gradient base. So starting from here and using some now that uh, formulating the problem and changing some variables, we can move from here to this point. Okay. So you might say, okay, but I can do a parametric study to do my optimal, to get my optimal solution. Yes, you can do it. And in this case, we get it very fast, but remember that your problems, you can have probably 20, 10, 100 or a thousand design variables and doing a parametric study with such a large uh, dimensional space design variables can be very expensive. So we rely on these techniques, gradient based techniques to move efficiently uh, in the design space just to compute sensitivities, not to find the solution in which the solution changes the fastest and then we get that maximum or that optimal value. So remember that we have this, this workflow in Dakota. So we're going to see how things work. So I, I will going to skip this one. Then you have the slides in, in, the, in, the, in the link, you have the description and you can download this. So what is happening also when we're running and we're going to run using something called a fork interface, this is what we have. Now we have a starting point where we have that base case directory, the case that we know that we're running Okay, that, that, that is running. Then we have the template variable. So in this case, let's say that I have U and P and I want to parameterize these variables and then run. And I have your, your problem formulation here and a simulator script that is uh, orchestrating everything. So in the end, everything will run automatically. You, as the, as the user, you only need to define your problem here and be sure that everything here, it is set up in the right way. And as, of course, that you need to have a, a good working case. Then in the end, that code uh, is going to run and it's, you're going to end with many directories and in each one you have the solution. If you want to keep the solution, you have everything. So if you want to keep that, you can, uh, that code can erase everything, but it would save your mat your, your metric, okay? The metrics that you are measuring. So that's it, what we're going to do, uh, the tools to use, well, Dakota, open phone, a lot of bash scripting. So you need to get familiar with bash scripting or whatever tool you want to use. You can put their Python, MATLAB, whatever, but you need to, to, to be able to, to program that, to parametri parametrize that just to do some modification, compute the stuff and so on. And these are our files and how things are run. So I think this is it. Let's run the case. And I have it here. Let me see. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Examples or again, in the video description, you have the link to download the case and this will be, so we have two cases cavity gradient and cavity vector parametric. So let me enter in this one. This is the first one that we're going to do. And let's open a few files. So first one, Dakota case. I'm not going into details. No, this is a more detailed video that we need to, to, to prepare, but just to give you a brief introduction. So Dakota case in here is where we formulate the problem. You can go into the documentation to see what is happening, but here we declare some environment basic variables how i want to where i want to save the outputs and so on and here we define the problem so we have vector parametric study so this is the method that we're going to use so remember that that you have the documentation that is quite good so probably you can come here and look and see that you have here what is happening your entries what you need to define okay how to set up the case okay so as you get lost at any point just go there in the documentation and you will find so basically we're defining a problem here and computing 30 simulations okay uh boom, 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 boom. i have one design variable i will call it x1 and the initial point is minus five x1 will be my velocity remember that is my parametric variable velocity and then i want to maximize maximize pressure somewhere in my domain. So, so for this specific method, I need to define initial point here, my final point here, and then the code automatically will compute all the subdivisions. Then I go into here, this is important entry interface. So here, I need to clean up this a little bit. Now this is uh, the code as 6.18. So since changed a little bit, so there are some entries that they're not needed anymore. So they don't do anything. So this is stuff like 
a prayer profile can be can be erased but i need to clean it clean it a little bit so basically we use the for interface asynchronous means run many cases at the same time run launch four simulations at the same time okay and this is my simulator script where i define everything and this is the name of the inputs and output files automatically you know, created by the caller okay that's all and then i have only one objective functions i don't need gradients and hastians remember this is a uh, parametric study. I just subdivided my design space so I'm not computing any gradients, nothing. So it's quite easy. So that's all. This is how we define the problem and important here that we have template there. So in this template there, we have our parametric variables. And, then, and later we're going to see how do we do the name, the, the parametric substitution. But this is the script that is orchestrating everything. So I open here and this is pretty much the same script, what you need to put here is instructions according to your problem. So look at here that you have different blocks uh, preprocessing. So here's where we do the parameterization, substitute the names of the variables. So in this specific one, we, we have this file, you template, this is the parametrical variable, and then read this file, identify where you have the parametrical variables, and do the renaming and save it in this file. Okay, so this is, is you know how to use OpenFone. In our case, we're using OpenFone 11. You know that here you have velocity. This extension, I put it because I, I want to, to do it like that, but it's the one you don't put it. But already in this step, you have your parametric variable with the substitution. Then here, see that you go into the analysis, and here is the steps as you were typing them in your terminal window. So if you go back here, look at that, you are just moving files. So I know that here I have my case that is working. And at this point, I am inside a very specific directory where I'm running. Later, we're going to see that. Then run block mesh, phone run. Remember, we're in open phone 11, so everything changed. Do the post-processing here and just creating some files to do post-processing. And that's all. I done with the with the simulation analysis step and then go i go to the post processing which is very important because here you need to extract that variable that you're computing and you need to give that information back to the coda so in this case i know that i'm measuring pressure in the middle of the gap cavity and i know that open phone always saves that information here for this specific case so i'm using here some batch scripting as i mentioned it's very important to know a little bit of that or whatever tool that you are using so extracting that and now here and moving this information into this file so when you see dollar two we're talking about results.out this is the file that dakota wants with the information of the of the of your metrics and when you see dollar one is what that code is generating for you to put into your parametrical uh, variable. So here that code is generating a velocity value that you are substituting here. Okay. So this is what we have. And now let's talk about the parametrical variables. So as you go here and template there, we have, in this case, we have just velocity, you template. So see that is the same name that you define here, very important, use the same name convention, you template. So if you look at this, this is open phone file. Well, I need to update, update headers, but we are in open phone 11. And see that whatever you see these cordless braces with the name of the variable, this is my parametrical variable. So in a standard case of open phone, you would put there one, whatever. So now here you can put just curly braces and X1, the name of the variable, Y X1, recall that here, I call it x1 and that's all so now you can create as you can see it's quite easy parameterize any dictionary any file that you have here in dakota just proceed in this way and it will be parametrical okay uh you might be wondering okay but what happens that is this curly brace enters in conflict with some other variables in open phone i already checked in open phone there is no problem even if you have no curly braces there okay so it's unlikely that you're going to have a problem but if that happens that you have a problem now with this it can be changed so this delimiter can be changed check that into the documentation but i can tell you that safely in open phone you have no problem and this is how you create parametric variables so for instance you want to parameterize in the hour let's say viscosity value you can go here take physical properties then put here your curly braces and then give it a name, whatever, I don't know, banana. Okay, I always put banana. Then go here, 
define your new vari variables, attention that now you, you have to design variables, and that's all. You are ready to go. So now that being said, I think we have covered a lot. Okay, so see what is happening. You template that template, this template variable that we have here, identify this, change the variable, and when you change the variable, we'll rename this to u.in. So this is kind of to, to have a safe file, a backup file, original file. I have a backup file, but I know that later I will need to rename it to you. This is what I'm doing here. Okay, and that's all. So now let's run the case and we're going to see better the, the, the directory structure. So to run, it's very simple. So remember that before running also, you need to have the quota needs to be accessible so I can access the quota, but also open phone, you need to load open phone. So let's go. So it's minus I, and then the name of the input file that is case.in. So here's where you define the, the problem. And let me go there. I define my problem here and everything is, let's say it's a schedule it's launch from here then simulator screen and so on, script and so on. So now let me go here, boom, and see that it's running. It launched all the computations in, in serial, let's say four, but it's doing everything automatically. And see that we had at the end 31 function evaluations of this simple problem. Everything was done automatically. So let's see what is happening now. So let me go here and this is what we have mentioned that now it's important to see the directory structure. So every single of this directory corresponds to a different function evaluation. So my output, I have it here, table out. So as you recall that somewhere here, I say save everything here. Okay, so that's why it's there. So I see that the first evaluation used this velocity and this is the output. So as you go here, you will see that you will have all that information there. So what is happening, and now let me let me, this part, this step is very important. Let me go back to the simulator script. So if you are here in simulator script, you do, as soon as you enter here, you are inside of one of these directories. So everything that you are going to do, it is relative to this directory. So let's say that I am work there one and see that I will do the paper to do the variable substitution. So see that now you have this file, u.in, you have it here. So see that you have U template. So Dakota is moving those files. See that is the original file. Now the file was the substitution, U in. And remember that every single step that comes from here needs to be in this directory. So look at that here, I'm moving files. These files that I'm moving are coming from here. Okay, so that's why I'm using dot dot. Okay, so this is very important to, to have this present. Okay, so you need to, when you define your case, you, you have to be careful to give the, the, the right path. So this is a relative path. So move my base case that I know that is always working, move this file to the zero folder, and there you go, you have a working case. Okay, this is my working case. And then launch block mesh, phone run, do the post-processing, you have the information, and you know that here, here, this is the file because you are measuring the pressure in the center of the, of the cavity. And I want this value. Okay. So this is, as you see, it's quite easy. You just need to understand your, your application. Then I create this. This is the touch file now to open an open phone. Okay. Then I go to post-processing. I use the tail command. So this tail command is just getting into the file the last line, this colon, and extract the, the, just that value. So I'm doing that, save that in this file. And then here I'm saving, it's saying, just move this information into $2. Remember, $2 means results.out. So in results.out, I'm going to have this information, only this. I'm not going to have anything else. So if I go here, And let me open the file results.out, see that you have it here. And you have the patterns in, this is what Dakota is generating. So Dakota says that I propose this value of velocity. It will do the substitution in the templates in and so on. Then I have results out and see that I have that single value. This is what Dakota need, needs to keep iterating. You can have multiple 
outputs here. So you can have two, three, four design variables, non-linear constraint, linear constraints. This can get very complex. And that is the subject or more advanced video tutorials here is just a short, very short introduction. So you can get an idea. And this is it. We're at this point, we are done. We have a working case. So if we go back here, what happened was that all those files, all these sing single boxes, everything is happening there and it's being controlled automatically by Dakota, but it is very important that the user needs to define those automatic steps. So it needs to define names of variables, how to process files, move information from here and from there. So if you enter in any of these directories, see that you're going to have all that that structure. So also be careful now because you're doing large cases and you save all the information, you will have a very large trace of data. So you can run very fast out of a space. That happened to me, it happened to me very often. So also you need, sometimes you need to be very clever how you, you deal with that data. So this is our case. Okay. The, the first one of the parametric cavity, we have the results here. And per se, this is not a, an optimization case. It's just a, a design analysis of computer experiments or parametric, parametric study. But it happened that here we can see the optimal value. So now let me use new plot to plot the information. So I go plot. You can use any program, by the way, and use new plot in this case. It's the fastest option. And there you go. So sorry, that is a little bit small, my screen. Okay, let me go. Uh, ta, 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 with points, um, point tight seven, I think, if I not mistake. Yeah, this is much better. And see that this is what it happens. Okay, so Dakota is not one. Okay, sorry that I also realized that I need two, two column two and three. So this is uh, FLID. So I, this is my velocity and this is objective function. So I need to use here column two and three. Okay, so there you go. You have it start from minus five and see that this is what is happening in your problem. And somewhere here, you have your maximum value that is something about 0 0.5, if I would recall, we mentioned. And this is it. Okay, we have the parameter, the our first parametric study or optimization study. And remember that you can launch also Paraphone. Okay, let's compare. So let's go here. And you might be wondering you now, probably you read this, what, it, what is the purpose of this? This is just to create the, the dot .phone file and then you can post process. So if I go to here, see here that you have it there, you open. So this is part of those post processing tricks. Okay. So it's all to you. So this is what we have in this case. And then if I open another case and we can start to compare solutions and I just want to show you that you have all those solutions there and they are different, of course. And there you go. We have this one. Okay, so see that now as we're changing the velocity, see that the minimum, the, the pressure, the, this region of recirculation is moving from here. Okay, and also we have a change in the minimum and maximums. So see that the this core is here, and then as you keep changing the velocity from left to right, right to left, this is going to move. So kind of what I wanted to do here is to have that region in the middle of the cavity. So kind of a symmetric problem. Okay. So this is it with this case. And also I used to put in this directory, see that you have this Dakota clean, clean it. So you run that file and it will cancel everything. I'm not going to cancel. Maybe I would like to compare solutions later. So now let's move to the next one, which is cavity grading to show you what is happening there. So in cavity grading it's pretty much would be the same. So I'm not going into much details there just to show you only the Dakota case in where we formulate the problem, but the simulator is created is identical, nothing changed. And see that here, the only difference that now we're using a different method. So here we're using this method to do the optimization. This is a proper optimization. Okay. We formulate a problem. It start from a value, compute sensitivities, arrive to your value, to the optimal value. So we're using this method in particular, but let me go from, uh, for this one, no, the method of feasible direction. This is the, the polar river, the traditional polar river method. And there are some entries there and so on that you can bring in the doc documentation. So let me go here just to, 
to show you that you copy that method and let's say that put it there and there you go this is the method that you have you're using you will have some references there what are the compulsory entries or is you have some other entries that are optional and so on the variables okay so here I, again so now in this case see that i have from minus 10 to 10, I bound my domain and I give a starting point. And when I talk about this, this is the, your problem formulation. And it's very important. You need to formulate a problem. It has to be a robust formulation. Otherwise, it might happen that it will be very slow. The convergence to the optimal solution, if it converts to that solution, it might converge to something else. Okay, so be careful about that. Just sit down and formulate your problem. Then pretty much as the same case as the previous one, your simulator is created, these files, and so on. But important here now, look at that. We're still running asynchronous, but now evaluation concurrency. Here, let's say that, let me put here four, but it, or you can put 100. It will not make a difference because now in this case, in the previous case, the solutions or each of the cases, now you go there and let me go back. Each of these cases, they are not dependent of each other. So the solution in Wordir 11 doesn't depend on the solution of the Wordir 1, 2, 3, whatever. So the cases can run independently. Now that I'm running a grading, the solution in Wordir 2 will depend in my depending word there one. So I cannot run three simulations at the same time because I have that dependency. That is, I need to compute the simulation in a point and then the gradient, another evaluation to compute the gradient. I cannot move further than that. Okay. I cannot predict the future. And probably some people will say, oh, okay, that is what I want to do uh, with machine learning. It might be possible to do it, but it will be super expensive. So you cannot predict that if you don't have the data. So you need to run, get that data, compute that sensitivity. After you have that sensitivity, then the the the, the method that your world you're using will tell you, okay, now you need to move in this direction. Your next candidate to evaluate will be this and run those simulations. So usually you can run a function evaluation plus an evaluation of the grading. In this case, we have only one variable so at most we can run two functions at the same time so it doesn't make sense you put here a thousand or whatever the maximum will be two the same is that is you have 10 design variables the maximum function evaluations that you can do it will be 11. okay uh it might change a little bit if you are computing your those uh gradients using central difference. So if you use central difference, remember that you, you can compute two, two points, so you can do 20 at the same time. But you, you said here, when, when we compute the gradients, it's not like in, in CFD, in finite volume, that you need to go the second order accuracy. The forward method first order is, is good enough. But anyways, you can play with that. OK, you have the case here, and you can play. So let me go here back to, to one. The, the rest is the same now here. It's a little bit different from the previous, okay? One function evaluation, but now I need numerical gradients. I need to estimate those gradients. And what we have here in CFD is that you never know these gradients, okay? Maybe you're doing a mathematical problem, like the previous case. Now, when we, when we installed Open Dakota 6.19, I show you the case of the soda can, and there we have the analytical function. So you need to compute the, the numerical gradients. You use analytical gradients because you can derive that function. Here, we don't have any function, okay? So you need to do the numerical approximation. So this is the method. You give some parameters and then what you want to do. This is the sense. You want to maximize. You want to minimize whatever you want to do. Okay. So you can maximize, minimize, or you can make it equal to a tar target value. You know, you can add those, those constraints. So in this case, we want to maximize and that's all. The rest exactly the same. And let me launch the problem. So I go here, the quota. Bam, 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 bam case and now there you go so it's computing all your gradients doing all the magic you have some information there you will see it. and now it reached the end and look at that it's going to tell you that okay i evaluate the objective function this many times i compute the gradients this many times and i think that 
your best value is here. So see that it's telling me that the best value, the velocity is something about 4.70, uh, 0.48, let's say, and your maximum objective function that I say that I want to maximize, you have it there. Okay, so here is not like in the previous one that is, I, I like to call it brute force. Okay, so you have enough resources, go ahead and use brute force because that would be fantastic. But when things get complex, it's not very efficient. Instead here is moving or using a sound method to, to get to that optimal value. And if I could go look at the directory, see that I have all my trace of whatever it happens. I want to point out that there are many methods. So different methods might give you different convergence rate. So let me show you here that that code to clean up. Let me click clean everything. And now let me rerun using the other method, this one. So this is a quasi Newton method that they have very, very good convergence rate when they do conversions. Now look at that, this one, it only, it only needed like 12 function evaluations to get to the optimal value. The previous one, it was a little bit close to, to 30 and it got to the exactly same value, probably, you know, a decimal point more or less, but you have it there. And this is what it happens here with Dakota. Everything coupling, everything orchestrated, basically using this Dakota in and this simulator script. And this is important part. You as the user, you need to define all these steps. Okay. You have to be super sure that these steps are working, that you are not going to crash your bash terminal, your, your terminal windows or whatever. And then you are also responsible just to post-processing the data to give that the metric, your fun objective function, your quantity of interest to give it back to, to the quota to keep looping. And as for the previous case, we can launch Paraphon. Yes, right there. And we can go. So now this method, okay, it will start from one value that we define and then it will start to iterate until converge to the uh, to the optimal solution so see that we have this and then we go to the optimal solution bam, bam, bam. let's go 12 usually is the last one the optimal solution but you need to to read the log files it will tell you precisely what is your optimal solution put this one here and if i go here and i change the scales see that we have it here. So basically, not as I said previously, what, what I was looking for is just kind of with this metric, it is a little bit equivalent just to, to, to move the, the vortex to the center of the cavity. And let me compare here. So in this one, let me put, put it here. And I don't want to see this one here. Let me change that scale here. And here, let me change this scale here. And let me link cameras. So this one now they are link and there you go that and also that scale okay they are linked this scale so if i need to the link also you have different scales there but this is what is happening the vortex initially was there probably would be better if you put velocity vectors there okay i don't want to see those vectors there i want to put it here and I know I want orientation but I don't want scaling cool and this one also I don't want that put me here put me back towards there apply I don't want scaling and there you go much better so see that the bird, the bar test was here and now I move here and you can compare this case also with the previous one. No? So the parametrical study. So in the parametrical study ta, 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 is this one. So that optimal value is something function evaluation 18. Okay. Ba, ba, bam, 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 zero point. Okay, so it will be about, yeah, 18 or 17. So let me open 18. 
and go there, open there, and this is our solution for this case. Put it there, hide this one, and see pretty much we have there our solution. Let me rescale this one, should be similar scales, a little bit similar, but this is what happens. So this is how you couple the code with any black box solver. Okay, can be any black spot solver in this case we're using open phone. I have used that code that was very complex uh, workflow. So I have done like coupling ANSYS tools, ANSYS meshing to generate the mesh, then pass that mesh to open phone, then for an open phone, pass that that, that results to part of you, do fancy post-processing in part of you, then pass that the output in VTK to Blender, do photorealistic, uh, uh, photorealistic rendering and generate reports. So things can get very complex, but as you can see, you can automatize everything here. So yes, this is all. I hope you, you found it useful. This so let me do this small philosophical reflection regarding you know, this machine learning, which is fantastic. By the way, if you want, you can skip the video we're done. But talking about machine learning depends on the application. So let's focus in CFD as we were doing using OpenFone, and that can be very, very expensive. So let me bring here, probably you have done some machine learning neural networks. You have played with this data set, the NNIST data set, which is the letter. So this very small data set has 60,000 images now that you can use to train the model and to train that model. You need to use state-of-the-art GPUs and it's time consuming. I recall I did it a while, a long time ago, and it took it took a while to train that. Now imagine the new data sets and talking about daily stable diffusion, mid journey, runway, NL, they do use very large data sets. And here now I have this web page, you know, Lion. And well, they are the ones that train some of these the train now they, they gather the, the information now for for these data sets and the latest one that they have is this one five billion images and text pairs and you can imagine how expensive it is to train that data set now so dali i think it is something about 2.5 billions the latest stable diffusion is 1.5 billion images and text per pairs to to train and imagine also the cost, okay? The cost can go well above $1 million to train that. And that's, this brings me to CFD. If you want to do something similar as people's doing with these models, uh, text to image, video to image, image to image, or, or text to video and so on, you need to have in CFD a lot of data and that can be very expensive. So I think, Right now, as we are, I don't see any advantage of spending time uh, with machine learning and CFD. However, I think that the, there are many applications, and let me talk about that, about machine learning, not precisely trying to reconstruct the solution and so on, because you know also when you do this image, text to image, the, 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 the the algorithm can start to give you some crazy solutions, crazy images. And imagine that if you want accuracy in CFD, that can happen. And that will tell you that you need even larger data set. But just bringing here to this function, I like to use this one because I was doing a, have been doing a lot of surrogate meta models. So this is a very nice function, highly nonlinear, analytical here, and basically have three, three minimum points here. So I'm going to talk about surrogate based optimization. So surrogate based optimization or also machine learning, we can put here the regression models that they're exactly the same. So basically it consists is just getting the data, train your model, and then you predict. Okay, pretty much is that. But there are different techniques. So a while ago when I was using this a lot, I was using creating interpolation, which is a fantastic technique. I still think it's the best one, but depends also in the dimensionality of your data set. So usually small data sets, Using Cree interpolation is fantastic, but when you have large SAT data sets, Cree interpolation is not very practical. So here, what you see in this, these two figures, you have exactly the same results using Cree interpol interpolation of the branding function that I show you. And this is a machine learning model using XU Boost, by the way. Okay, and as you see, the results are exactly the same. However, in this case, we only 
with certain design points or experiments, we managed to get very good solution. Here, the machine learning model, it required at least 300 design points to reconstruct the same solution. So this is a sense that you need to wait. Now, usually small data sets, using you know, these Gaussian processes or polynomial models, whatever, they can give you very good results. But then if you start to increase your data set, since this one, they don't work well, you need to use some other methods. And as well, this method, the XGBoost, when if I try to fit this information here, it doesn't work, it gives horrible results. So you need to know when to use the right technique. So a while ago, Recall I was trying to do this stuff that you see in CFD, some people is trying to reconstruct the solution. I was trying to use creating interpolation. I was completely wrong, okay? And it was super expensive. And at that time, the GPUs, this stuff, there still was was starting. You know, it was like 2011, I started that kind of research. And today, that's in, it can be done, but I think there is a lot of uncertainty in CFD the other applications, image recognition and text to image, all that stuff, it works amazing. Okay, so what is happening here that to reconstruct this one, for instance, decreasing only certain experiments and see that with certain experiments, you are able to get something. The machine learning, the other one next you use is you put the same data, it will give you terrible solutions. And to get a good solution, at least like 300, 400 data set. But it's fantastic, no? And these are those regression models. But it's still here and getting the, 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 the quantity of interest and not getting the whole field. And to reconstruct something in the whole field will be super expensive for the years to come. Then also very interesting of having these regression models is that also you, you get more information. Not only you see the colors, you can also get you now, what is happening in your whole design space is you try to optimize this function like this without no, knowing that it's quite tricky you now because you start from a point and you don't know what is happening. So this is the extra information that you get with these models that can be expensive to to train, but it works if if you have the data, it works to, to, to use them. Then let me talk another subject. So we talk about this machine learnings and methods XGBoots, but also we can move to image recognition techniques and something that I do very often now using this one because sometimes measuring a quantity is not enough for me. So talking about this workflow and this specific application now, what I was doing here, and let me go here because this is a nice, okay. So basically we have a, a, this application and it changed the inlet here and it's changing the outlet here now. But here I wanted to measure the uniformity of the velocity at the outlet. And it was quite tricky to measure that quantity. And sometimes measuring a quantity can be very difficult, even in CFD. So for me, it was much better to get an image there and then see when I get the result that I wanted, that I had a, a target image, that is my optimal solution. So using some image recognition techniques, in this case, I was using you know, this, this criterion SS in the SIN index structural similarity in this, I managed to conduct this optimization study. So basically consisting only in getting here the image, the photo at the outlet, and then I have my target distribution. So here I wanted this velocity distribution at the outlet. And then by just simple compiling images, okay, while it was running, I managed to get the optimal result. And this is something that it was really, really difficult to do just measuring here that quantity because you don't know what will be that quantity. It can be the integral in this patch, but what is the value? 1, 1.5, 1.6, you don't have no idea. You can also put lines and things can be, can get really tricky. So instead of using those traditional methods, now using image recognition, you can get you know, uh, the solution for difficult problems, the problems that since they are not very straightforward. And the issue here that it's happening is that, and let me illustrate this one with this famous problem or the SCOM quartet, that it might happen in many cases that you have your data, okay, and coming back, you know, the data that you use to train your models, that you can have the same a statistic a statistic for the da data set. So, so look at the, these data sets are very different, but the statistics are pretty much the same. And that is a big problem. So when you plot things, look at that are com entirely, entirely different data sets. So I like also to use this figure. This is the, it's a very nice 
publication and there you, you have the reference also so it's the data saurus and basically that i show in there here that you can have very large data sets very common and completely different and they all have similar statistics so you have to keep to be careful about that so not only look at that data but also from time to time take a look at the image so this is, was my goal here that that data wasn't giving me the right results so now when i look at the image okay that was a completely new uh dimension that opened to me but always have the data i'm precisely funny that in this data set i was having that problem that there were some of these images that i have exactly the same statistic but the outcome was completely different so I just want to stop here. This was this my small reflection about this. It's fantastic machine learning, artificial intelligence, and I think there's a lot of future there. But in CFD or in any application that is expensive to get that data, like in CFD, I think we need to wait a little bit more because the time to 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 get those models, the data, it can be too 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 much. And also, what is important is. This is brute force, okay? So we, we are trained as engineers in CFD, so it's better to use intuition rather than just start getting here and say, okay, let me gather a million, let me do a million simulations, get the data and see that by using brute force, I can train my modeling, can give me a good solution because by using my engineering intuition, probably I can get to the optimal solution using 10 simulations. Okay, so that's all for this. So this was this small reflection and also this introduction to open phone dakota coupling and i hope you enjoyed this and see you next time bye